Hello, everyone. Um, I would normally commence this introduction by acknowledgement, acknowledgement of country and paying respect to our First Peoples. However, in this particular instance, uh, it would be inappropriate as both the speaker and myself are out of Australia, more specifically, we're physically located in Athens. So in this respect, I pay tribute to the goddess of wisdom, Athena, to which this great city is named after, and I acknowledge its great statesmen and philosophers of classical Greece. Welcome to tonight's online seminar. Uh, it'll be delivered by uh, Dr. Dimitris Gamouzis, entitled Constantinople and the Megalia there from unification with Mother Greece to the creation of an Ionian state. Uh, allow me to go through some housekeeping items before we venture in tonight's seminar. We would like to thank the sponsors of tonight's seminar. We have two sponsors tonight, Theo and Zografos. Thank you, Theo, and the Ithacan Philanthropic Society. And I invite you all to become sponsors of a seminar of your choice. It's only a tax-deductible $100 donation. Furthermore, let me remind you that next week's seminar on the 19th of May is the annual Pontian Genocide Memorial Seminar. It's a hybrid seminar, so we'd like to see as many of you as possible at the mezzanine level. It will also be simultaneously broadcast for those who can't make it. And just a reminder for those that will have any questions during our Q&A interval, simply submit them through the chat or comment section on Facebook or YouTube. Now tonight's seminar, Constantinople and the Migali there. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the concept of the Migali there, an Iridentist project of vision to regain lands which formerly belonged to Greek empires or had settled Greek populations. It was a policy which dominated Greek politics and foreign relations in the 19th century, but also the early 20th century. And the great prize in this aspirational and expansionist quest and vision was a capture of Constantinople, the former Byzantine capital before its fall to the Ottomans. The seminar tonight will be mainly focusing on 10 to 20 years before the Asia Minor catastrophe, in other words, the early 20th century. The speaker will provide an overview of the political identification of the Petrocate and the Constantinopolitan Greeks with Eleftheros Venizelos and the Migali there. Uh, we are honored to have with us today Dr. Dimitris Kamouzis, a researcher at the Center for Asian Minor Studies in Athens. Uh, given his background, he received his PhD in history at King's College London. Uh, his thesis was on the Greek Orthodox minority of Istanbul from the mid 19th century to 1930. Uh, his research interests include history of the Greek Orthodox populations of the Ottoman Empire, history of Greek Turkish relations with a focus on minorities oral history, and the settlement of Asia Minor refugees in Greece. His recent publications include Greeks in Turkey, Elite Nationalism and Minority Politics in the Late Ottoman and Early Republican Istanbul. This was published by Routledge in 2021. And also, it's got a forthcoming publication, Greek Soldiers and the Asia Minor Campaign, Aspects of a Painful Experience, of which he's co-editing. Uh, enough for me, I pass on a baton to our speaker tonight, uh, welcome, Dr. Kamouzis. Uh, thank you, uh, Nick, um, for your um, kind introduction and for your kind invitation to participate um, uh, in the uh, Greek history and culture uh, seminars uh, of the Greek community of Melbourne. Good evening to everyone who's, uh, who's with us uh, uh, in Australia. Um, and what I will uh, uh, what I will talk about today um, forms part of, of, of my book uh, mentioned by uh, Dr. Nick Dallas, uh, which was published um, in 2021. Now, uh, the years um, 2022 and 2023 will be highly emotional for Greece. They will mark the uh, 100th anniversary of three events that transformed the country in ethnographic, social, political. Uh, and economic terms. Uh, the first of, of these events was the Asia Minor Catastrophe of September 1922, a term used in, uh, in Greece to describe the defeat of the Greek army in the Greek-Turkish War of 1919 uh, the burning of Smyrna and the atrocities uh, committed against the non-Muslim population of the city, mainly the Greeks and the Armenians, um, by the victorious Turkish army and local Muslims. 
Uh, this was followed by the Convention Concerning the Exchange of Greek and Turkish Populations um, uh, and the Treaty of Lausanne, the first one uh, signed at Lausanne on January 30, uh, 1923, and the Treaty of Lausanne uh, signed uh, on the 24th July, 1923. Now, as a consequence of the catastrophe and the compulsory population exchange, approximately 1.3 Asia Minor Greeks were violently uprooted uh, from the Turkish coastline and in Asia Minor, and they arrived in Greece, uh, whereas 350,000 Muslims, mainly from Macedonia and Thrace, were forced to take the opposite direction. Now, my book, as well as today's um, presentation, uh, focuses um, on a significant and, and largely unexplored aspect of these tragic events, which is the, historial, the historical experience um, of those Greeks who were exempted from the compulsory population exchange and stayed behind, uh, namely the Greek Orthodox minority of Istanbul and the islands of Ivindros and Tenedos. Now, the case of the Constantinopolitan Greeks, or Rum, Romni, uh, as they are known in Turkish and Greek respectively, uh, constitutes part of the broader discussion on the disintegration of multi-ethnic empires and their reorganization into national states and of the more specific discussion, um, as, um, as Nick already mentioned, uh, of the failed implementation of the Greek nationalist plan of the Megali there, the great idea, aimed at the liberation of the unredeemed Greeks, the Alitroti Hellenes. Uh, it could be argued that, in a sense, these outside Ottoman Greeks were caught between two opposing poles of authority and two mutually antagonistic nationalisms that of the Ottoman Empire, in which they lived and belonged as subjects, and that of Greece, with which they shared uh, transborder ethnic ties. The, the aim of today's presentation is to provide an overview of the gradual uh, politicization of the Constantinopolitan Greeks along national lines, uh, which facilitated their identification and especially the ident identification of their lay and religious leaderships with Greek redentist expansionism and the vision of Greater Greece, um, a process that would uh, reach its climax during the Greek-Turkish War of 1919-1922. Um, to, to this end, um, I will focus on the antagonism between the nationals, ethniki, and the anti-nationals, ad ethniki, the two um, political stances that emerged within the Rumileti, the Greek ethno-religious group of the empire, uh, after the Young Turk Revolution of 1908. And then I will engage uh, with the different stages uh, and aspects of their political practices. The main argument um, is that the responses of these communal elites uh, towards Greek redentism and Turkish nationalism conditioned to a significant degree the construction of specific representations and perceptions of the group's collective identity and determine the status um, of the uh, Orthodox Greeks of Istanbul as a national minority in Turkey until nowadays. <clears throat> now, the Young Tech Revolution of July 1908 is considered a defining moment in the history of the Ottoman Empire because it signified the beginning of the political radicalization of both Muslims and non-Muslims and the formation of a framework of violently and mutually exclusive nationalisms, which eventually resulted in the collapse of the Ottoman state and the establishment of the Republic of Turkey in 1923. On a political level, the success of the revolution brought to the foreground two competing parties that had begun to um, develop uh, during the first stages of the movement, the liberals and the unionists. Both of these groups shared the ideology of Ottomanism, but differed in the way they perceived it and the means used for its realization. The liberals, um, Liberal Antant or Freedom and Alliance Party, Hürijetve Itilafrika in, in Turkish, favored the decentralized administration system and the creation of a federalized Ottoman state where the different communities would retain their communal rights and administrate themselves through local government under state control. On the other hand, the Committee of Union and Progress, Itihad Veteraki Cemigeti, 
uh, mostly comprising junior military officers and a new emerging intelligentsia, set out to create a civic territorial nation along strictly secular lines where equal citizenship for all Ottoman subjects, irrespective of race or religion, combined with state-controlled policies, uh, would be uh, adopted as the means um, to create Ottoman unity. Uh, to put it in simple terms, the communal privilege, privileges and rights that ensure the political, cultural, and economic autonomy of the non-Muslims in the empire were perceived as an element of social cohesion by the liberals and, uh, on the other hand, as an element of social disintegration by the unionists. With, uh, with regard to the Ottoman Greeks, the revolution facilitated the emergence of two antagonistic clerical lay leadership groups. The Society of Constantinople, Organosos Constantinopoleos, uh, founded in the Ottoman capital in, 90, in 1908 by Athanasios Siliotis Nikolaidis, an officer of the Greek army uh, with experience at the Macedonian struggle, and supported eventually by the Greek diplomatic authorities, including Ion Dragoumis, a member of a prominent Greek family who served as a diplomat in the Greek embassy uh, of Constantinople, expressed the more ethnocentric circles of the community's leadership, the self-proclaimed ethniki, nationals or nationalists. Um, as the name suggests, the Nationals supported the original declarations of the Young Turks for equality and Ottoman Brotherhood because they believed that the implementation of a political program along these lines would strengthen the Greek ethnic identity and autonomy of the Rum community. In fact, both Siliotis Nikolaidis and Dragoumis had expressed views in favor of the Hellenization of the Ottoman state from within. In ecclesiastical terms, this group supported Patriarch Joachim III. Pavlos Karolidis, Emmanuel Emanuelidis, Vasilios Orfanidis, and a few other Greek deputies of the 1908 parliament, along with prelates and laymen belonging mostly to the anti Joachimist group, uh, formed the opposition to the ethnocentric circles. Um, Karolidis and, and, and the rest um, represented a more conservative, accommodating and loyalist political stance. Karolidis believed that the post-revolution regime would allow a sincere understanding between the Greek and Turkish element aimed at fighting the common enemy, the Slavs and more specifically the Bulgarians. However, uh, their collaboration with the Committee of Union and Progress made them unpopular among the Greek Orthodox population of, of uh, Istanbul and attached to them the derogatory name Adethniki, anti-nationals. Accusations ranging from opportunism and self-interest to servility and even treason cultivated by the Society of Constantinople, uh, the diplomatic authorities of Greece both in Constantinople and Smyrna, uh, as well as the Constantinopolitan and Athenian press, further stigmatized the anti-nationals as disloyal towards uh, the Greek Orthodox community as a whole. In the summer of 1908, the Society of Constantinople established its political instrument, the Greek Political League of Constantinople, which collaborated with the Greek Embassy uh, and appointed the majority of the Greek candidates for parliament. They ran the political campaign for the upcoming elections and gain control of the permanent on the permanent national uh, Greek Council, uh, which was basically the administrative body uh, of uh, the Greek Orthodox uh, community of Constantinople and in general of the empire. Um, in a short period of time, the Society of Constantinople uh, managed to mobilize support from broad groups of the population who were previously excluded from the political process, uh, namely um, the middle class. Um, at the same time, um, after the 1908 elections, the Committee of Union and Progress became the dominant political force in the empire. Immediately, they put into action their program of centralization and secularization by passing a series of laws which challenged the rights and privileges of the non-Muslim communities. The ethnocentric faction of the Orthodox Greeks regarded these policies as nationalist and, and oppressive. On 12 August 1910, the majority of the Greek deputies submitted an official protest to the cabinet. And I quote, all these policies 
establishing the conscience of the Greek nation, the certainty that it is held, like in the period of absolutism, as a prisoner whose confinement in a lower position is one of the objectives of the government's policy aiming at obstructing its development. Even more than before, there is the tendency of using the term of the constitution, Ottoman ethnicity, in order to impose Turkish ethnicity. In November 1910, 16 members of the Society of Constantinople split off the group of the 24 Greek deputies elected in 1908 and formed the Hellenic Party, Eliniki Omas, which received instructions from the Greek Embassy and the Society of Constantinople. Suliotis Nikolaidis criticized some of the deputies who had not joined uh, the, the Hellenic Party, arguing that they wanted to benefit from the relations with the Unionists and manipulate the Greek deputies. He characterized their policy towards the organization as hostile and added, referring mostly to Karolidis and his collaborators, that they had no other way to suggest than the raya, rayadiki, submissive uh, policy of tricks, cunning and flattery towards the Turks, a policy of whining and resignation. In contrast, the Union Greek deputies accused the members of the Society of Constantinople as fervent patriots, troublemakers, sycophants, and terrorists, while Karolidis, responding skillfully to the term anti-nationals, wrote regarding the successionist decision of the 16 deputies and the foundation of the Hellenic Party. And I quote, the formation of a Hellenic political party is an act most unlucky, reckless, and profoundly anti-national, divining the morally and nationally united group. It's an act that ridicules and annihilates the Greek section of the parliament, both morally and politically, and transmits this moral infection to a wider social, national, and ecclesiastical circle due to the anti-national, revitalized passions of lust for power, greed, profiteering, and the produced political corruption and terrorism. So we see the creation already of two antagonistic groups uh, fighting um, to um, retain or gain control of uh, the Greek Orthodox, of the leadership of the Greek Orthodox Milet. In January 1911, uh, the Society of the Constantinople and the Greek League established contacts with deputies from other ethnic groups, including the Bulgarians and the Serbs, in order to bring about a coalition against the Unionist regime, a policy supported also by the Greek state. The Hellenic Party criticized publicly the policies of the Committee of Union and Progress and reached an agreement with the Liberals for the elections of April 1912, ignoring the advice of Karolidis that the Liberal Party did not have the cohesion and the political organization to win the elections. The conservative faction argued that in the empire the power belonged to the Turks, and any effort for a Christian victory in the elections would be futile. They also blamed the Society of Constantinople for nullifying with its actions and understanding between the community, uh, the Committee of Union and Progress and the Patriarchate. Now, the, the defeat of, of April 1912 highlighted the competition of the different political elites within the leadership of the Orthodox Greeks. The conservative faction accused the Greek League and the Society of Constantinople for subjugating the Patriarchate and the Holy Synod in order to impose their candidates uh, for fake patriotism and for dividing the Greek deputies between unionist anti-nationals and non-unionist nationalists. On the other hand, um, the Greek League referred to Karolidis and the Greek deputies of the opposition as Raya and, crea and creations of the Committee of Union and Progress. In any case, um, the death of Joachim um, in November 1912 um, and uh, the, um, the election of Metropolitan of Halkidon, uh, Germanos Kavakopoulos, uh, as uh, Patriarch Germanos V, um, meant that the national Joachimist faction fell from power and the anti-national anti-Joachimist faction uh, became the dominant political force within uh, the, uh, the Greek Orthodox Milet uh, from uh, 1912 onwards. Um, the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913 uh, 
put, put Greece and the Ottoman Empire uh, on the path of the ultimate clash. Uh, Greece managed to annex Macedonia, uh, the rest of Epirus, uh, Crete and the Aegean Islands, Hios, Mytilene, Limnos, Samos, Ikaria, Thasos and Samothraki. Therefore, with the acquisition of the new lands, the Neas Hores, uh, Greece's territory almost doubled uh, from 63,000 to approximately 120,000 square kilometers, and its population increased from approximately 2,600,000 to 4,700,000 persons. Uh, And for the Ottoman Greeks, this was a clear indication that Greece was able uh, to fulfill its liberating mission of the Megali Idea and respond to its role as uh, the protector and national homeland uh, of all Greeks. Um, at the same time, uh, in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, the ideal of an Ottoman secular collective identity uh, proved fragile and Turkey's nationalism started to gain ground amongst the several other imperial policies um, of the time. Uh, several uh, several measures taken during this period by the Committee of Union and Progress against the non-Muslim population of the city um, and also of the of the empire um, on uh, the basis of uh, the homogenization uh, of the Muslim population uh, along uh, the, uh, the framework of Turkishness uh, and uh, at the same time, physical violence, mainly ethnic cleansing, uh, genocidal policies, forced migrations and de- deportations um, to purify Anatolia from the non muslim populations um, became, in a sense, the means uh, for the Committee of Union and Progress uh, to Turkify uh, the, um, the Ottoman society. Um, the, the only consistent effort of Patria Germanos V uh, to complain to the, to the authorities regarding the severe violent acts committed by the Union's regime against the Greek population uh, of the provinces uh, was between February 1914 and June 1915. During this period, Patria Germanos communicated a series of protest memoranda to Sultan Mehmet Rassat V, uh, Grand Vizier Said Halim Pasa, and Minister of Justice and Public Go- Worship. Ibrahim uh, Bey, and on uh, 27 May 1914, he declared the church in a state of mourning, shutting down all the temples and schools as a supreme way of protesting against state violence. Um, but all this, uh, these efforts uh, had no result. Um, the government, the, the Ottoman government of the Committee of Union and Progress, denied or in some cases downgraded the gravity of events, avoided to assume responsibility of any wrongdoing, attributing the deportations of the Orthodox Greeks to the consequences uh, of the war or outward solicitations, specifically Greek instigations, uh, as they implied, and repeatedly provided promises for the restoration of order, which remained unfulfilled, uh, thus essentially uh, denying uh, and refuting, uh, in a sense, the Patriarchate's claims. Uh, not being able to effectively contest the state policies, Germanos eventually entered into a relationship of convenience with the government, despite his personal discontent regarding uh, these activities. Um, now, first-hand testimonies of the period that refer to Germanos and the conservative circles differ on whether assuming a rather compliant political stance and being on good terms with the Unionist regime was a conscious and calculated course of action in order to retain power in communal affairs, or it gradually and unavoidably um, became a strategic choice in an effort to protect the Greek Orthodox population during the adverse uh, period of World War I. Uh, I would argue uh, that the one did not necessarily exclude the other. Germanos balanced between involuntary collaboration Uh, which was basically uh, a reluctant recognition of necessity and voluntary collaboration as a means to exploit that necessity. There is no doubt that the oppressive conditions of the war did not allow Germanos a lot of space for a more assertive policy. At the same time, there is no doubt that during this period, Germanos managed to effectively marginalize uh, the opposition within the Patriarchate. In the end, uh, the majority of the cosmopolitan Greeks came to consider Germanos a person favored by the Committee of Union and Progress and disapproved of his actions, ousting him ultimately from the patriarchal throne 
a few days before the signing of the Mudros Armistice in October 1918. Still, it could be argued that perhaps his stance, no matter how passive and, and controversial, protected his flock from an even worse fate during the war, comparable to the one of the Armenians of the Empire. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, in October 1918, uh, a few days before the signing of the Mudros Armistice, Patriarch Hermanos was forced to resign by the supporters of Greek nationalism in Istanbul. Immediately after the overthrow of Hermanos uh, and the election of the Metropolitan of Prusa, Dorothos Mamelis, as locum tenens of the Ecumenical Throne on 25 October 1918, two members of the Holy Synod, and all the national councillors of the Permanent National Mixed Council were replaced by supporters of the Greek nationalist plan of the Megali Idea. The main objective of the new leadership became the severance of the community, community ties with the Ottoman authorities and the systematic manifestation of their desire for enosis, unification with Greece. Breaking ties with the port served also the aims of uh, the Greek Prime Minister, Eleftherios Venizelos, who advised the religious and lay leadership of the Greek Orthodox Milet uh, to ignore the Ottoman government and explicitly instructed them to organize meetings and send signed petitions to the peace conference um, in Paris, stating the popular desire for national redemption and unification. As a result, on uh, the end of uh, November 1918, uh, a patriarchal encyclical was issued uh, announcing the elections um, for um, uh, the elections for new communal councils in an effort to, comp to, to replace the old communal establishment with one that would uh, champion the program of Greek redentism. But how about the population? Um, the the Constantinopolitan Greeks, um, alienated by the nationalizing measures of the Unionist regime, and disillusioned by the, uh, the compliant policies of the previous leadership uh, under Germanos uh, V, um, uh, identified with Eleftherios Venizelos and, and Greek nationalism. Uh, and at the same time, the Constantinopolitan Greek intelligentsia uh, supported and reinforced uh, Greek national feeling in the capital. A good example, a first example, was uh, when the Allied fleet uh, entered uh, the Bosphorus in November 1918, and uh, amongst the amongst the uh, the Allied uh, ships was uh, the Greek battleship Averov, and we have uh, this amazing painting uh, by uh, Likurgos Kogevinas, uh, painted in 1919. Uh, which depicts the, the entrance of, of, uh, of uh, battleship Averov in the Bosphorus. And we have also um, a very eloquent uh, description of, of the sentiment, of the Greek sentiment at the time, um, written years later by Yorgos Theotokas, uh, the famous uh, Greek author Yorgos Theotokas. Yorgos Theotokas uh, was a cosmopolitan Greek. He was a teenager at the time, um, and he was also a member of, of uh, the Boy Scouts in, in Constantinople. And he describes uh, in his um, autobiographical book, Leonis, the moment when um, uh, they found out that the Allied fleet was um, approaching, had crossed the Dardanelles and was getting into the Bosphorus. Um, and and I'd, I'd like to quote um, a small passage from that. And he writes, Theotokas, at the windows, there were three or four Greek flags waving. His ear took in various details of the events. Yesterday, the armistice was signed. The fleets were passing through the Dardanelles this morning. They're on the way, and the Greek fleet with them. Leonis went down to Straight Street. It was decked with flags from one end to the other. English flags, French, Italian, and especially Greek. The windows and balconies were crowded with people. The street looked as if a demonstration was underway. It was an endless festival of brilliant colors. It was a fine spring day after a rain, like Easter amid poppies and daisies. It was not inappropriate to say, Christos Anesti, Christ has risen. So all these uh, coordinated efforts resulted in the official resolution 
uh, for union of the Andredin Hellenism with motherland Greece, which was signed on the 16th of March 1919 uh, by the um, cosmopolitan Greeks who gathered in the churches of the city with a purpose to pledge their loyalty to Greece. And I quote, the Greek people of Constantinople and the suburbs, after gathering today in the temples, the only places where they could freely assemble throughout this period of tyranny, proclaim their unwavering will to gain their complete national restatement and consider union enosis with Mother Greece as the only firm basis for the natural development in the future and for the avoidance of further new implications in the Near East and are determined to resist with all their powers to any other solution. They ask and entrust the Humanical Patriarchate, their supreme national authority, to communicate the present resolution to the representatives of Britain, France, Italy, the United States and Greece at the Peace Conference. The same day, the Patriarchate officially broke off any direct communication and cooperation with the port. There is no doubt that the leadership of the community was fully devoted to Venizelos and his expansionism, a policy that entailed serious dangers. This fact became evident after the Greek landing at Smyrna in mid-May 1919, which enhanced the awakening of Turkish nationalism and allowed Mustafa Kemal to use the occupation of the city as a means to rouse the sensitivities of the Muslim population and gain popular support for organizing a national resistance movement. Uh, in, um, in the Ottoman capital, about a week uh, after the, the Greek landing in Asmina, there was a massive demonstration of thousands of Muslim Turks. And uh, to get an idea of, of what was happening at the time and how that creation of two um, uh, opposing poles of, of nationalism was created and entering the path of, of the final uh, clash, um, I'd like to, to read uh, the words of Halide Edid, a famous Turkish nationalist, feminist author, who spoke uh, during that massive demonstration in Istanbul, and she remembered uh, that experience uh, in her autobiographical book, The Turkish Ordeal of 1928. And I quote, The idea of the meeting was at first simply the making of some sort of protest against the Smyrna massacres. The political part did not interest me, although the protest seemed entirely natural and necessary. I was concerned with the pain and the disaster which could no longer be ignored. When the talk came round to the choosing of a speaker for Ojak, each one looked at the other nervously and seemed to be hesitating. I will speak, I said at last, which pleased everyone. As I looked up and realized how far my voice would have to carry over a mass of people estimated at 50,000, I quailed. Leaning over the black draperies on the railings of the balcony, I fell under the spell of a sea of faces. I realized that their supreme demand was ad identical with mine. We all long for hope, for absolute belief in our rights, in our, in our own strength, and I gave them what they wanted. Brothers, sisters, countrymen, Muslims. When the night is darkest, seems eternal, the light of dawn is nearest, I began. However, Despite these mass uh, public protests in Istanbul against the landing, the military achievements of the Turkish nationalists, the warning of the Allies, and the strict policy pursued by the pro-nationalist administration of Valeriy Zapasa towards the non-Muslims in the capital, uh, the Orthodox Greeks, guided by the Patriarchate, the LA communal leadership, and the Greek High Commission, continue to express publicly their national feelings and their support to Greek irredentism. We see here uh, several uh, examples of that uh, open uh, expression of public sentiment, uh, which obviously picked uh, uh, with the uh, signing of triumphant signing of, of the Treaty of Sev uh, in August 1920, uh, which in a sense uh, was the creation of, of greater Greece, of, of uh, the two uh, continents and five seas of Venizelos, is Greece. Um, uh, nonetheless, um, Venizelos' loss in the elections of, of uh, 1st November 1920, just a few months after the signing of the Treaty of Sevres, was a turning point uh, for the policy of the Venizelis leadership 
uh, in Istanbul. Uh, on 9 November 1920, the Committee of National Defense, uh, Epitropi Ethnikis Aminis, uh, was formed in Istanbul with the aim to undertake a propaganda campaign against King Constantine and the new government, and with the support of Venizelos, lead a movement for the creation of an autonomous government in Smyrna. In late December 1920, uh, Konstantinos Panoudis, Leonidas Yasonidis, and Georgios Stavridis, the three representatives of the committee, met with Venizelos uh, at Nice in France and asked for his support. After this meeting, Venizelos communicated a letter to Sir John Stavridi, uh, the former Consul General of Greece in London, an intermediary between Venizelos and, and the Greek and the uh, British Prime Minister Lloyd George, asking him to assist them in making contact uh, with the British Prime Minister. Um, and the letter wrote, the gentleman of the committee will explain to you that it is not a question of action directed against the Athens regime. Insofar as Greece, even under Constantine, wishes and is able to hold Smyrna, we will all applaud reserving to ourselves to settle our accounts with Constantine later, when our national work is consolidated. But as soon as Constantine decides to evacuate Smyrna, because he does not wish or is unable through lack of money to preserve it, at that moment there will be autonomous action by Hellenism in Turkey. Apparently, uh, the British Prime Minister Lloyd George was in favor of the idea, with the precondition that Constantine would have first failed um, uh, to uh, impose uh, the terms of the Treaty of Sèvres. The positive response of Venizelos and, and Lloyd George encouraged the committee and reassured them as to the legitimacy of their aspirations. But for the achievement of this uh, political program, the cooperation of the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople was essential. In uh, March 1921, Dorothus passed away in, in London from heart failure, uh, and in April 1921, the Patriarchate decided to hold a patriarchal election in June, uh, making the relations between uh, the Fanar and the Port even worse. At the same time, the patriarchal election uh, became also an issue of contention with Athens, uh, which was uh, fully aware that the election of a pro uh, Venizelos patriarch um, would, uh, in a sense, um, would in a sense diminish its status uh, in uh, Constantinople. Uh, Venizelis Constantinople and, and royalist um, Athens fought hard over the, the issue of the election, and after several postponements and a series of irregularities during the electoral process, uh, the Committee of National Defense managed to impose uh, the Venizelis uh, Patriarch Meletos Metaxakis um, uh, as Patriarch on December, uh, on 8 December 1921. Uh, Patriarch Metaxakis, uh, Patriarch Meletius, immediately endorsed um, uh, the cause of the Committee of National Defense, uh, becoming one of its leading figures. In late December 1921, the committee approached General Anastasios Papoulas, the Commander-in-Chief of the Greek Army in Asia Minor, and Aristides Theriadis, uh, the Greek High Commissioner at Smyrna, uh, in order to explore whether they would support um, a separatist movement in Smyrna. Papoulas' initial reaction was positive, uh, but um, uh, he made clear that the collaboration of the Greek government was essential uh, for, um, for such a project. Uh, Steriadis, on the other hand, rejo rejected the proposal outright uh, because by that time he was convinced that the Greek occupation of Asia Minor could not be maintained and he had already started sharing this opinion uh, with both foreign diplomats and uh, his colleagues uh, at the High Commission. Now, according to the, uh, the D-Date plan uh, submitted by the committee uh, to Papoulas on 21st uh, February 1922, the evacuation of Asia Minor by the Greek army would have disastrous effects on the Greek Orthodox populations who would be exposed to the persecutions of the Turks. Only a movement headed by Papoulas could unite the royalists and the Venizelis within the army uh, and allow the army to face uh, that threat. While a mass meeting uh, would be held in Smyrna in order to show their support uh, to Papoulas, uh, the, the foundation of the Ionian state, uh, Ionico Kratos, uh, would follow 
and Venizelos uh, would be appointed as the delegate of, uh, of that new state to Paris and London. The committee uh, would inform the great powers in an effort to gain their support, arguing that they could already count on the positive stance of Britain. The Greek communities uh, of America, Europe and Egypt would also be invited to contribute to the cause with their money and blood. According to the committee, the Asia Minor Army would, com would be composed of volunteers from all Greece, the islands, the Greek diaspora, Asia Minor and finally Constantinople, which they claimed could alone gather troops exceeding 25,000 soldiers. With regards to the financial part of the new state, the committee relied on the donations of the Greek communities abroad, the contributions of the communal and private properties of Constantinople, British financial aid, the imposition of a military tax in the occupied territories, and the issue of a loan of 100 million drachmas, which would be covered by Greek funds. Uh, when the memorandum was submitted to Papoulas, Venizelos was completely unaware of these proposals and the position carved out for him by the Committee of National Defense. He was finally informed about the movement by Meletius' telegram, uh, which was forwarded to Venizelos uh, via Emmanuel Benakis in mid-March. And uh, in this telegram, uh, Meletius wrote, General Papoulas, at the head of a united national army, is prepared to put himself at the disposal of Asia Minor Greeks, who will declare themselves as a state at the National uh, uh, Assembly and continue the fight for freedom independently of the attitude of Greece. He sent the Deputy Chief of Staff, Sarianis, to ask for my support, which I promised wholeheartedly. He counts on you as a diplomatic representative. I am convinced that the motives behind this movement are completely of a national character. We warmly beg you not to deprive us of the strength of your arm. Uh, Venizelos' uh, response was uh, rather reserved. Uh, he did not encourage nor dissuade Meletius and his associates. Apparently caught off guard by the negotiations between the committee, uh, Meletius and Papoulas, uh, Venizelos was uh, gradually um, taking further distance from the committee, despite the fact that it was actually him, along with Lloyd George, who had encouraged uh, the Kostnopolitan the Greek leadership uh, at the beginning of the movement. Uh, in any case, nothing came out of these uh, negotiations. Um, and the failure of, of, of the separatist plan considerably destabilized the Venizelists in Constantinople, who were in desperate need of, of political orientation. Within a period of one month, uh, between May and June 1922, um, Meletius, uh, wrote three times to Venizelos, reassuring him about the commitment of the Asia Minor Greeks to the Greek statesmen, asking for advice in order to adjust the policy of the Patriarchate accordingly, and expressing his resentment for very Stergiadis' overall stance. By that point, it was too little too late. On 6 September 1922, Venizelos, who had re remained unresponsive to the agonizing letters of Meletius and the Committee of National Defense, finally broke his silence, and replied with the following laconic telegram. It is impossible to comprehend what purpose the suggested declaration would serve. It is unacceptable to provoke a civil strife at a moment of disaster before the external enemy. Now, the bottom line was that after encouraging the Patriarchate and the Committee to pursue their successionist aspirations and rupture their relations with Athens, Venizelos had hung them out to dry. Overwhelmed by their nationalist and Venizelist fervor and poisoned by the political fanaticism of the national schism, the fanar and the lay leadership of the community provoked the indignation of the Muslim population and exposed the Ottoman Greeks to the danger of retaliations from the nationalist Turks. The collapse of the Asia Minor Front, the burning of Smyrna, the tragic death of Metropolitan Chrysostomos in the hands of the Turkish mob and the atrocities committed against the non-Muslim population of the city shocked and terrified the Constantinopolitan Greeks. The supporters of Greek nationalism were the first to flee the city and seek refuge in Greece. Patriarch Meletius followed suit a year later and eventually stepped down from the ecumenical throne 
on 15 October 1923 under pressure from Venizelos himself. The minority who remained in Turkey had to face a number of challenges. Stigmatized as a deviant and threatening outgroup and abandoned by their leadership, they had to face the consequences of the political choices of the FANAR and the Committee of National Defense, and at the same time, adjust to the new conditions created after the signing of the Treaty of Lausanne. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, um, Dimitri, um, for that sort of um, presentation. Um, just must ask you a question before questions come in from the audience. Can you tell us a few things about the um, Centre of Asia Minor Studies uh, where your research are at? A um, bit of a background on the Institute. Um, describe some of its present holdings. Are there sort of any exhibitions on the horizons? Just give us a bit of a background, please. Right. Uh, the the Centre for Asia Minor Studies um, is perhaps the most important institution dealing with uh, the history of um, uh, Hellenism of, of Asia Minor. It was established in, uh, in 1930 by um, the musicologist Mel Pomerlier, uh, who was from Eastern Thrace and she, had, uh, she grew up in, uh, in Constantinople, and her husband Octave Merlier, uh, French and director of, of the uh, French Institute in Athens. Um, and now uh, the, uh, the, the Center for Asia Minor Studies, uh, the, the, the core of, of, its, um, of its material, it's the oral tradition archive. These are interviews from uh, first generation Asia Minor Greeks. Uh, we're talking about uh, approximately 5,000 interviews um, taken from, uh, uh, from, nine, from 1930 until the early 1970s. Uh, it's it's a massive uh, material. We're talking about approximately three hundred thousand um, uh, handwritten pages uh, of, of testimonies, which cover all three periods of the life of Asia Minor Greeks. So, the first period, nineteenth century, early twentieth century in Asia Minor, um, the, the the tragic experiences, um, the, the tragic experiences of. Uh, of uh, um, 1919, of the, the first persecutions, 1919-1922, and the exodus, and then the difficulties of, of establishment uh, in Greece during the interwar period. Um, at the same time, uh, it has several collections of, of uh, very rare publications. Uh, for example, publications from, um, from Smyrna and Constantinople of the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century. Uh, we have the most, perhaps the most important collection of, of Karamanli books, meaning books uh, written uh, with the Greek alphabet, but in Turkish, um, mainly uh, addressing the populations of Cappadocia, um, and uh, and also it's um, uh, it's open obviously to the to the general public. We have both uh, um, people from the academia using that material. Uh, but also, you know, schools, universities, students, people who try to um, uh, to learn more about their uh, their roots and their ancestors. Um, and uh, one of the one of the main um, activities we're involved with regards to the commemoration of the Asia Minor catastrophe is uh, is a big exhibition we're co-organizing with the Benaki Museum. Uh, it will be held in Athens uh, at, the, at the branch of the Benaki Museum on Piraeus, where the 1821 exhibition has taken place. Uh, it opens in, uh, in September um, 2022 and will run all the way to uh, April 2023. Um, we've gathered approximately 1,100 uh, 1, exhibits. Uh, uh, anything you can imagine from uh, icons, um, Ecclesiastical garments, dresses, uh, uh, pictures, uh, whatever anyone could think of. And we cover all three periods life in Asia Minor, uh, uh, Greek campaign in Asia Minor, and then uh, the Exodus and uh, the settlement of the refugees in, in Greece. Uh, and I would, I would personally welcome anyone uh, who, who would be in Athens to visit. I think that it would be, uh, it would be worth your, uh, your time uh, there. Okay, um, thank you for your background. And we've got the first question that's come in from um, Vesman Likopandis. 
did Paris support the Greek movement against the Ottomans, or did Paris support Venezuela's stance? When we're talking about Paris, we're talking about the, the peace conference or France? Yeah, the, the peace conference, yeah. All right. So the Paris, uh, the Paris peace, peace conference initially uh, supported Venezuelos. Uh, we're talking especially uh, Britain, France, and the U.S. Uh, these were the three countries that supported Venezuelos uh, initially, and uh, these are the uh, these are the countries that, um, that decided to send uh, the Greek army in uh, Smyrna. Uh, the aim was uh, to protect the local uh, Christian population. Uh, but uh, eventually, uh, this became um, this became a zone of uh, where the, the Greeks were holding the zone of Smyrna, and it also meant the establishment of the High Commission in in, in Smyrna uh, and, and the presence of Greece in Asia Minor. Uh, the Treaty of Sèvres obviously was the result of uh, the support of uh, Britain, France, uh, and the United States. Uh, but after the loss of uh, after the loss of Venezuela's loss in the Greek elections on November 1920, uh, and the uh, the government, the pro pro uh, pro royalist government in, in Athens, uh, the pro royalist government in Athens decided to bring back um, the expelled King Constantine, and that was uh, that was used as a pretext by um, by the Allies uh, to abandon. Um, uh, the Greek Air Force uh, and um, stopped their support, uh, saying that we would not support a country uh, where uh, a king that had been against us uh, during the First World War is again uh, has returned to that country. And uh, and the main problem is that the the uh, they stopped not only the military support but also the uh, financial support. Which, in a sense, drained uh, and uh, strangled uh, financially the Greek state uh, with regards to their very expensive uh, Asia Minor campaign. So that was there was a switch at that time. Uh, France and Italy uh, started uh, collaborating uh, with uh, indirectly uh, uh, started collaborating with with uh, the Kemal and uh, the Turkish nationalists, as did also the Bolsheviks. Uh, the British um, could not uh, continue their support uh, to um, to the regular government. So we see there were, in a sense, this this lack of support after November 1920 played a major role uh, in the in the collapse of of, of the Greek army eventually uh, in the end of uh, in the in the summer of 1922. Yeah, well, the supply lines were quite severely affected, so. Yeah, obviously. Um, just a follow-up question from, from that. Um, also, is it true that Greece gave new identities in the form of new surnames to Greek refugees coming into Greece from Asia Minor with no papers? Uh, no. No, not, not necessarily. Uh, no. Uh, for example, the suffix of Lu, which, is, uh, which was a typical... Uh, Ottoman or Turkish uh, suffix uh, remain. Uh, uh, what happened is that people who came, look, look, the the people who came with no papers, just to make this clear, and with no documents, are the ones uh, that came with the first wave of refugees. There are two waves of of, of, of refugees in Greece. The first wave, the ones who experienced the violence in uh, Smyrna and in the western coast of, of Asia Minor, came having almost nothing uh, apart from what they were wearing and, and carrying their uh, their, their, their children, in most cases, like with them. Uh, so these these people uh, received after after uh, after a couple of years, they received the pistopitika prosfigikis idiotas, the refugee, uh, the, the documents of refugee status. But that did not mean that they changed their their surnames. The second wave that came uh, within the frame within the framework uh, the, within the framework of the exchange of populations uh, from Cappadocia and Pontus. Um, mainly uh, had documents with them uh, and also they received the similar um, refugee uh, papers uh, but there's no real uh, changing in, in in the surnames of, of the refugees as far as, as I know not not to the at least to extend that 
to an extent that you know it could be noticed uh, as something unique in that in that story. Well, someone could have wanted to hide their background so deliberately lost their papers or whatever and start a new beginning, but that's a different story or category. Um, I've got a question from Mary Rakis, which is almost a reply might require a totally whole seminar. Um, Mary asks, can you tell us more about Eon the Vdavumis? I'm not too clear as to what he supported. Thank you. So just um, uh, a brief summary on the <laughs> of Eon Dragumis. This is this is this is a great question, but it's <laughs> <laughs> it needs an <laughs> exactly an extensive answer. Well, look, Eon Eon Dragumis Eon Dragumis uh, uh, from a lot of aspects was um, uh, was. Um, an ideologue. He was he was part of the Greek intelligentsia. A lot of people considering him also the, the you know among them the main personalities of, of, of Greek nationalism at the time. Um, very very uh, you know well educated, coming from uh, from a really important uh, family of, of politicians and diplomats and so on. Uh, Dragumis, um, when he was in, in Constantinople, uh, he Dragumis was disappointed by the fact that uh, Greece had failed to, to implement uh, by that time the Megali idea. He had he was also disappointed by the uh, by the failure of the 1897 Greek Turkish War, um, which was which was a, a trauma for for that generation. Um, uh, and Dragumis, uh, when he was in Constantinople, he he genuinely believed in the idea of of reforming the, the the Ottoman Empire from within. He believed in that Hellenization from within of, of the Ottoman Empire. Um, at the same time, he was uh, he was considered as one of the main figures of the anti-Venizelist uh, of the anti-Venizelist camp, um, and from especially during the Greek national schism, so from basically the the, uh, the end of the Balkan Wars and uh, when we have like the beginning of the First World War, when we have the national schism, he was considered among the very prominent uh, figures uh, of the anti-Venizelist camp, and. And unfortunately, he was he was um, assassinated uh, in the middle of the, of the street in, in Kifisia uh, by the Venizelists uh, in reprisals. Uh, and it was uh, it was it, I would say it was a major loss because you know even today you know reading going back to his uh, to his books and his thoughts, you realize that he was a, a really uh, uh, he was a major figure in 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 in, in the formation of, of, of Greek ideology and and Greek politics in the early twentieth century. I mean, his thoughts echo uh, even even today. This is in a, in a nutshell. I mean, I could. <laughs> this is the best I could do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were supposed oh, to. Have a, few on ago, on yeah. a few years ago, a seminar on Dragoumis was on the agenda, but the speaker had to pull out. But um, anyway. Um, I'm just summarise the next question. With respect to the Treaty of Lausanne, Lausanne did it contain um, a passage precluding Greece and Turkey from mining minerals and fuels in their respective territories? The Treaty of Lausanne? Yep. Wait. Uh, let me also... Yeah. So was there a clause in the treaty where which precluded Greece and Turkey from uh, mining minerals and fuels from their respective territory? Um, I have to see that uh, right now it doesn't come to mind. I don't know. I have to see the. I have to see the treaty. What I know for sure is the fact that uh, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of deals with both British and American companies, which had started already, uh, that the process had started already under Venezuela's administration. Uh, they continued even under the royalist government, under Wunner's administration, and so on. This I know for a fact, uh, which meant that the, the several companies would have rights both in Greece, in mainland Greece, 
but also on the in in Asia Minor and on the territories that Greece would gain under the, uh, the terms of the Treaty of Sèvres. But whether there was a term or the terms as such in the Treaty of Lausanne, I have to look at it. I don't know. Yes, it was more about the preservation of exploitation rights from those um, foreign companies rather than, yeah. Okay. Um, got a question here from Conspiropolis. Did Venizelos need to hold elections at the time the country was in a state of emergency or war in Asia Minor? Wow. That's the... Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, this is the question uh, everyone, <laughs> everyone asks since then. Um, <clears throat> right. Um, I, I don't think there's a clear answer. I'm sure that one, one thing is that the, the, the death, of, of, uh, the death of, of King Alexander played a major role in his decision. Because once King Alexander, like King Alexander dry, died prior, uh, to the to the election, so therefore uh, there was an issue. There was again the issue of um, of, of what will happen with who's going to be the next king. Uh, so that there was a, a major issue there. Um, I think Venizelos expected to win these elections. To be honest, I mean he had just signed perhaps the the, the greatest success in the modern diplomatic Greek history. And we should not forget that about like two months prior to the elections or three months prior to the elections, there was this massive, uh, this massive celebration of the Panathinaikon Stadio. And, you know, nobody, nobody I think expected um, for Venezuela, at least Venezuela did not expect to lose the elections. And also it meant that for Venizelo, she would mean the, uh, in a sense, uh, approval of his of his policy. Uh, but at the same time, I think Venizelos had not really had not really uh, assessed uh, properly the impact that you know the Asia Minor campaign and, and all, not only the Asia Minor campaign, but also the the impact that all these wars from 1912 onwards had. On uh, the on the population of, of old Greece, uh, I mean one of the main one of the main uh, um, policies uh, promised by the anti venezuelist uh, uh, group uh, was to that they would bring back the soldiers. So that played a major role uh, in in the elections. Uh, but whether uh, whether he had to take to, to do these elections. Well, there were a lot of people who, like even people from the Venezuelist camp, who later on blamed Venezuelos for uh, for actually holding the elections in, in 1920. And there were also people who implied that he he you know he held the elections because he knew he would lose the elections because he knew apparently that uh, he would not be able to um, to impose the Treaty of Sèvres on on the Kemalists. But these are all you know uh, hypotheses. I mean, it's not hypothetical. Yeah, yes, and surely probably misread the misread the public mood. I mean, it was taking a it's a heavy toll on, on the public and then the, the deaths and okay. um, just might finish off with one final question from from Savas. Um, do you think that Greece should try to entice those of Greek ethnicity and who are Greek speaking in Turkey and Syria and other places who are Muslims to come back to Greece to be repatriated? Who? Cool. Uh, um, I think you might have specifically in mind. I think there's some um, um, Turkish-speaking Greeks in, of uh, or Greeks and Greeks in Syria or something like that. And, and make these I mean, the, the, you look uh, like, for example, we yes, there are there are people like for I, I I guess that we're talking about people from Antakya, from Antiochia. Yes, this I guess this is where the question is. Uh, these That's are the, that the, only one specific group here. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, I'll I'll speak from personal uh, experience uh, because I I grew up in near Philadelphia, which is a predominantly refugee settlement. And in the 1980s and 1990s, there were a big chunk, like like a significant number of of uh, Orthodox Greeks coming from Antakya, uh, who they are trilingual. They speak Turkish, they speak Arabic, and they speak Greek. And these people, uh, I think that they were 
in, you know, integrating into Greek society, fine. So if, if that means, send, you know, if this is an, an answer, like judging from, you know, uh, their experience and the, the, how they were incorporated into Greek society, I think this is feasible. But whether this is something that could be an official Greek policy, this is not for me to answer. Thank you for that. Um, so growing up in near Philadelphia, does that make you an, an egg supporter, Dimitri? Yes, I think this is uh, this is inevitable. If you if you grow up here, you cannot be anything else. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you for that, um, Dimitri. Um, thank you for your time once again. Thank you. Um, thank you. It was a maybe maybe one one day, that we will come back to Melbourne. Αυτό ευχαριστώ όποτε θέλετε. Χαρά μου. Πρώτο αθεός, χαρά μου. Thanks once again and um, hope to have you back sometime in the future too. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And um, just a reminder, next week's seminar is a hybrid seminar, both at the mezzanine level of the Greek Centre, but also broadcast live as well.